Welcome to part two of the Reader's Digest Beginner's Video Guide to Home Computers. In this tape, we're going to take you on a tour of the World Wide Web and show you what it can do for you, from researching health topics to finding and booking airline reservations to linking up with others who share your interests. We'll also show you how to use a software inside your computer to write letters and organize your life. We'll teach you in a step-by-step -step manner using simple, everyday language. So think of this tape as a personal coach. If you don't understand something, rewind. We'll repeat it. And if you're still not sure, you're likely to find the answer in our viewer's guide that's included with this tape. We want to make sure you have everything you need to get the most out of your computer. So, if you're ready, we'll start with a tour of the universe called the Internet. In our last tape, we introduced you to the world of email. But email is only part of the equation called the Internet. An even more exciting part is the World Wide Web. The Web is a, a research library, a shopping mall, a travel agency, a news center, and a town hall, all within the reach of your desktop. To begin exploring the Web, we're going to go back to your ISP. An ISP is your Internet service provider, the company that connects you to the Internet in the same way that your cable company connects you to cable television. Your ISP provides you with email software and an email address. But there's another important piece of software that comes with this package. That software is called a browser. And your browser is the way in which you access the World Wide Web. When you signed up with your ISP, they gave you email software like Outlook Express. They also gave you browser software. It'll probably be on your desktop already. One of the most popular is Internet Explorer. The other common browser is Netscape Navigator. Using your mouse, move your pointer to the browser icon on your desktop. Now, if it's not there, uh, simply click on the Start button. Then click on Programs and see if you can find it in the Programs menu. If you don't see a browser and you are signed up with an ISP, you may have to call their technical support to make sure that you have one. Once you've found the browser icon, double click on it. This will open a new window and launch the browser, automatically connecting you to the Internet. The first thing you'll see on your browser window is your home page. Think of your home page as your old homeroom in high school. It's just the place where you start, and sometimes a place where you organize your information. The browser window has a title bar, a menu bar, and a toolbar. The most important buttons on this toolbar, for now anyway, are these. Back, Forward, and Home. We'll explain them as we move along. Right below the toolbar, there is a box for the web address. Web addresses are like house addresses, and each web page has a different one. I'm going to explore more of the web now by going to another web page. First, I'll move the pointer to the web address field and double click. The web address of the current page is now highlighted. Uh, for an example, let's go to the Reader's Digest site. I'll type in www. The W stand for World Wide Web. In web and internet addresses, the periods are called dots, but they're the same thing. After the period with no spaces, I'll type readersdigest.com. Like an email address, a web address has no spaces in it. Now I hit the Enter key, or I can use the pointer and click on Go. The browser is now searching the entire web for this address, but within seconds, the Reader's Digest web page will appear. Here I can find the online version of the magazine, with articles and archives from past issues, as well as 
questions, emails, and comments from readers. When you go to the Reader's Digest website, don't be surprised if it looks different from this screen. The web is always being updated. Websites constantly add more information and improve their pages, and they might look different at a later date. Now, there's a difference between a website and a web page. A website is simply a collection of linked web pages. ReadersDigest.com is a website, and each of the articles is a different web page. Web pages are linked to each other through buttons that connect you directly to another page. You can always recognize a link because it's either clearly marked as a button or some text is highlighted or underlined. When you click on the highlighted word or on the button, you will instantly be taken to a new page. Let's try moving to different links on the Reader's Digest website. Now, I'm going to move the pointer to the link on the Reader's Digest site marked in this issue and click. Now, I'm taken to the new page, the equivalent of a table of contents for this issue. I can move the pointer to one of the articles and click on Read the Article Online. Now I'm at a different web page with a complete Reader's Digest article in front of me. There are thousands of web pages to explore, but fortunately, you cannot get lost on the web. Near the top of the page are the buttons we talked about earlier. When I click on the back button, I'm now back at the previous page. I'm going to click on the back button again. Now I'm at the page before that. You can use the back button like breadcrumbs through the woods, finding your way back home or to previous sites you might want to explore. The forward button works the same way. After you've gotten deeply into the web, you can get back to your starting place by using the back button repeatedly. But there's a simpler way. Just move your pointer to the toolbar and click on the home button. This will bring you back to square one at your home page, no matter where you are in the web. There are so many websites out there. How do I find a good one? Well, there are literally millions of sites on the World Wide Web. Fortunately, we can get some help in narrowing down the choices with something called a search engine. A search engine is a kind of yellow pages of the web, and it can help you find information on nearly any topic you can think of. So let's explore a popular search engine. Begin by moving the pointer to the address window near the top of the screen. Type www.yahoo.com. Then hit the Enter key or click Go. Yahoo is one of dozens of well-known search engines Excite, and Google, or some others. With a little exploration, you'll find out which are your favorites. Ah, we're now at the Yahoo search engine web page. Search engines research thousands of websites and arrange them in categories that make them much easier to find. Well, let's take a look at one of the Yahoo categories, such as entertainment. I'll move the pointer to the category head and click. Now I can see a listing of various subcategories for entertainment. Movies, music, and a lot more. I'm going to click on Movies and Film. Now I get an even larger list of subcategories. Actors, history, reviews, and trivia. I'm going to click on Reviews. And then I'll get a list of websites and a short description of each site. Clicking on any one of these websites will bring me directly to that site, where I can read reviews of new and classic movies. With a search engine, you can look for websites about religion, animals, business, sports, or any one of a dozen categories. Let's say you have a specific research topic in mind. Now, one of the most popular things to research on the web is health. 
No matter what the health topic, you'll find information about it on the web. So, as an example, let's research high blood pressure. There are a lot of good health sites on the web, but I'm going to try this one. I'll click on the address box and type www.cbshealthwatch.com. Well, now this brings me to a large website. It's filled with articles, health news, tips, suggestions, a medical dictionary, and more. There's also a search field at CBS Health Watch. So I'm going to click on the search box, then type high blood pressure, then click on go. Now I have access to hundreds of articles on high blood pressure from many different publications. Some define the condition, others discuss detection, treatment, cure, and prevention. Well, let's look at another health site, planetrx.com. PlanetRx offers a community forum. Now this forum or message board functions somewhat like a local bulletin board. People pin up questions or comments. Then other people pin up answers or comments below that. And still others respond to that. There are thousands of discussion pages and message boards across the entire web. Some are devoted to specific topics. Uh, some are aimed at specific age groups. And some just connect like-minded people. Let me show you one other shortcut. If you want to come back to this site or return to any other site you think you'll visit frequently, move your pointer to the toolbar and the button marked Favorites. Click once. Now, move your pointer to the line that says Add to Favorites and click. Yahoo is now available to you at a single click wherever you are on the web, without having to click back to it and without having to remember its name. Whenever you want to access this site, you simply have to click on the Favorites button on the toolbar. Then move down the menu to the site and click again. You can put any site that you think you might visit frequently here, but a search engine like Yahoo or Google is a good site to have in your list. A search engine can be your first step in a long and exciting exploration into the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web is a great source for news. It's faster and more up-to-date than your daily paper, and it's more convenient than the evening newscast. You can get the news whenever you want, from a search engine, from an online newspaper, and even from your own home page. You can also go to a dedicated news service like Reuters at Reuters.com for up-to-the-second reports. You can look at some top news sites like CNN or MSNBC. Or check big city newspapers like nytimes.com or at washingtonpost.com. You can probably even find your local newspaper on the web as well. Another type of site that you may want on your favorites list is a financial news site. Thestreet.com is a daily financial newspaper that's only available on the web. Its homepage gives you headlines about finance, columns by some of the top stock market gurus, and the current state of the Dow, the NASDAQ, and the S&P 500. You can also find financial news at sites like Motley Fool and the Wall Street Journal. And if you want to take it even further, you can do your banking, manage your portfolio, or buy and sell stocks on the web. Sites like E-Trade and Schwab.com allow you to trade stocks, bonds, and mutual funds right over the internet. I've heard I can trace my family roots on the web. Is that hard? One of the most popular topics on the web is genealogy, or tracing your family tree. You can go to a search engine like Yahoo or Google and type genealogy in their search box. You'll get a list of dozens of categories and hundreds of sites. You can go to a site like genealogy.com and type in your family name and then find family connections from around the world. You can begin constructing your family tree and link up with others who possibly share common ancestry. 
In fact, no matter what activity you can think of, there's probably a website to do just that. We want to plan a vacation for our anniversary. Can we do that on the web? Well, it's not only possible to plan a vacation on the web, it's simple. We're going to use your personal computer to research and book an entire trip, from plane reservations to hotel rooms to daily activities, without ever leaving your desktop. Let's say you wanted to take a week-long vacation in Florida. You've seen how you can research the web for information about things like entertainment and health. Well, now you can use those same skills to research vacation spots and travel locations around the world. Let's begin by seeing what the hotel rates are in Orlando, Florida, and book a room. There are many different travel sites on the web. Uh, we're going to use one called Travelocity, but there are equally good ones like Expedia.com and LowestFare.com. Move your pointer to the web address box and type www.travelocity.com. Now hit the Enter key or click on Go. When the Travelocity web page comes up, you can follow the directions on screen for several different ways to book a vacation. Let's start by clicking on Hotels. Well, now we're looking at the Travelocity web page devoted to hotels. First, let's type the city in the search window. Now, you're going to be asked a number of questions about when and where you want to stay. I'm going October 14th through October 21st. Now, click on Search. Within moments, we have a list of all the major hotels in Orlando, along with prices and availability. Well, let's say you prefer to stay in a mid-price hotel, like this one. We click on the name of the hotel, and within a few moments we see a description of this hotel, sometimes with pictures. If we like this description, click on Select Hotel. Now, we'll double check the dates. And finally, click on Book Now. Now you'll find yourself at a web page that asks you to enter your name and information, and possibly a credit card number to hold this room. Now with that experience under your belt, let's book your flight to Orlando. Travelocity is just one of many websites that'll not only make flight reservations, but will search every airline to give you a choice of the least expensive or the most convenient flights. Return to the Travelocity homepage by clicking the back button or click on Go. Now, click on the flight reservation button. You'll reach a page that asks you when you want to leave and return, and what cities you're arriving at and returning to. Well, I'm going October 14th, and returning October 21st, leaving from Chicago, and arriving at Orlando. Now you can tell the search engine which times you'd prefer to travel. Well, I'm going to put in a 10 a.m. departure and a 10 a.m. return. Now, I'm going to tell the search engine to look for the least expensive fare. Click on the search button and wait while it scans the entire web. You can also search by a specific airline that you prefer or by flight times that you prefer. Ah, the website has now finished its search. Before you is a list of the cheapest flights to Orlando on the day you want to travel. Over a dozen different flights from various different airlines at or near your preferred departure times. You see, with airline ticket prices varying to such a degree, you can save several hundred dollars by using the web. Well, I'm going to travel on a budget, 
So I'll choose the least expensive flight that's nonstop. I'll click on that flight. And a new web page will appear, which will ask me for all the information the airline needs to book my flight. When I finish entering this information and click on the appropriate button, the reservation is made and they can mail me the tickets tomorrow. Or they can give me an e-ticket, an electronic confirmation that means the ticket will be waiting for me at the airport when I arrive. I can also use a travel site to reserve a rental car or buy tickets to attractions, following almost the same procedures as booking a flight or booking a hotel. And if I don't know my way around Orlando, the web can give me a map and driving directions. In fact, you can get maps and driving directions from www.mapquest.com. The map web page will ask you where you're starting and where you want to go. Well, I'm going to type Orlando International Airport. My destination is the hotel I chose earlier. After a moment, I'll get not only a map of the route, but written driving directions as well. You can use map websites to get directions to anywhere. When it gets closer to your trip, you'll want to check the weather in Orlando. You can use the weather link at Yahoo. Type Orlando, Florida in the search window. Then click. You'll see the five-day forecast for Orlando, with links to more detailed reports. In fact, you can even look at live photos from weather satellites. You can check the weather for your hometown, for an upcoming trip, or for any part of the globe, making it clear that the web truly is worldwide. I keep hearing about e-commerce and about people buying things on the Internet. How easy is it to do that? Shopping on the web is easy. As a matter of fact, what you've just been doing by researching a vacation and booking travel arrangements is often called e-commerce. E-commerce simply means buying and paying for things electronically. Now we're going to go on tour of a virtual shopping mall, a mall we build ourselves, filled with the merchandise we want to buy and the stores we want to shop in. It's faster than a normal mall, it's less expensive, and there are no parking lots. There are lots of popular e-commerce sites. For example, let's try gifts.com. From your home page, click on the address line and type www.gifts.com. Now hit enter or click on go. You'll soon see the gifts.com page, which features great gift suggestions and special offers. I need to buy a wedding present for a relative. I could look through the online catalog, or I can do a special search. I'm going to type wedding in the gift.com search box and click on search. Within a moment, I can see an entire list of wedding gifts of various styles and prices. I like this pair of champagne flutes, so I'm going to click on this link. Now, I'll arrive at a new page which describes the gift in detail. If I decide I want to buy this gift, I'll move the pointer here to Add to Shopping Cart and click. A new web page automatically pops up, showing that I have selected this gift to place in my virtual shopping cart. I can now go on browsing in the store and adding gifts to the shopping cart until I'm ready to check out. When I'm done shopping, I'll move the pointer to the button at the bottom of the page that's marked Checkout and click. This will take me to a web page where I can pay for my gifts with a credit card. Then, I can have the gift shipped to me through regular mail or overnight package. I can also have my purchases sent somewhere else. 
Gifts.com will even include a card with a message from me. You can buy other products over the web in the same way you bought gifts. Books, clothes, gourmet foods, just about anything that you could buy through a catalog, you can buy over the web. And there's a great deal more on the web than you could ever find in a catalog. E-commerce is changing the way we do business. From everyday shopping, to prescription and health purchases, and even to grocery stores, which take your shopping list and promise to have your groceries delivered within hours. As you can see, the World Wide Web is a library, a mall, an encyclopedia, an advice column, a bulletin board, and simply a place to hang out. People have created strong bonds of friendship over the Internet, and the Web has connected people of similar minds in ways that were once unimaginable. It's true that the web is the world, but there's also an amazing world right inside your computer. In this next section, we're going to look at some of the most popular and useful programs for the computer, and most are already inside your computer's hard drive. We're going to explore accessories, like calculators and art programs, the address book, and word processing in depth. So let's see what your computer can do to change your life for the better. Let's begin by taking a look at some simple software that can make your computer use and your life much easier. They're called accessories. I'll begin by moving the mouse pointer to the Start button at the lower left of the screen, then click. The familiar menu will appear. I'll click on Programs, and a sub-menu of all the programs on the computer appears. At the very top of this submenu is the word Accessories. When I click on Accessories, another submenu pops out. You can see that there are a number of accessories available. We're going to look at the most popular ones, but the Accessory menu is well worth some exploration. There are some tools here that are very useful. I'm going to click on the item marked Calculator. As you might have guessed, it can be used like a regular calculator. I can press the keys with the mouse button, or use the numbers on my keyboard. Or I can use the number pad at the right of the keyboard. The calculator's keys are identical to the number pad's keys. Either one of these ways of entering data will work. Let's clear the calculator by clicking on the close button at the upper right. Now let's look at another accessory. Click on Start, then on Programs, then on Accessories. Move down the menu to the line marked Address Book. Click on the address book and you will find a contact program that can help you keep in touch with people and remember important facts. With the address book, you don't have to remember your friends' email addresses. Once they're entered here, they're automatically linked to your email program. When you're writing email, all you have to do is click on their name and their email address automatically appears in the send window. But the address book is more than just an email list. Move your pointer to the icon marked New and click. On the menu, click New Contact. You'll see a series of forms you can use to keep track of contacts and of phone conversations, as well as addresses and phone numbers. Not only can you enter the usual information of an address book, but you can also enter information about their job or business. You can enter the name of your contact's spouse and children. You can also make notes about the contact or keep a log of conversations and phone calls. The accessory address book can be a helpful way to stay in touch with your friends and family. And it can be a powerful tool for keeping track of business and professional contacts. 
The accessory menu also lets you place CDs from the CD-ROM drawer. You'll also find a drawing program that turns your mouse into a paintbrush, a marker, a pencil, and a spray paint can. There are also other games besides Solitaire. Classics like Hearts, Minesweeper, or Free Cell. There's also an important accessibility program that will modify your desktop and all of your programs if you're hard of hearing, have vision limitations, or have slight physical limitations. Failing eyesight, poor hearing, arthritis, or carpal tunnel pain don't have to limit your ability to use your computer. The accessory menu is one of those small details inside your computer that can make your life and your computer use much easier. And there are other programs and functions in your computer that are helpful and fun. So go ahead and explore. You may be surprised at what you can find and what you can get your computer to do. In the first hour of this video, we showed you how to write a short list, but that was only a taste of what's available in the world of word processing. Remember, if you know how to type, even if it's just hunt and peck, you know how to word process. But word processing has tools that can take you far beyond anything a typewriter can do. And with a little practice, these tools can be easier than a typewriter. Let's start out by writing a letter. I'll begin the same way I begin any program, by moving the mouse pointer to the Start button and clicking. Once the Start menu has appeared, I'll move the pointer up to Programs and click. We're going to use Microsoft Works here, so I am going to click on Works, then click on the word Processor in this submenu. Just as before, once the program begins, you will see a window that looks like this. As always, the title bar is at the top, with the name of the program on the left, and the minimize, maximize, and close buttons on the right. Below this is the toolbar, and below that is the white space where you write your letter. Let's begin simply. Dear Harv, I enjoyed having lunch the other day. Thanks for all your help. It's great to have a friend who is so knowledgeable. I hope we can do it again, maybe next time, with both families. Sincerely, Marcus. The first thing you might notice is that there are some words that are underlined in red. I didn't plan to do that, so what is it? It's probably obvious with the first underlined word. This is a typo. You see, Microsoft Works and many other word processing programs automatically check your spelling and often automatically point out mistakes to you. So how do I go about fixing these mistakes? First, use your mouse to bring the cursor up to the end of the first underlined word and click. The blinking cursor is now there. Uh, there are several ways to change the spelling now. The simplest may be to use the backspace key. This is the key in the upper right portion of your keyboard with an arrow. Use this key to erase the letters before it. In this case we'll hit it once and erase the E. Now we'll type R and replace it. The word is spelled correctly, and the red line disappears. You can do the same with the next underlined word, but let's say you're not sure how to spell knowledgeable correctly. Well, that's all right, because the computer does know how to spell it. Move your cursor so it's somewhere in the middle of the word knowledgeable. 
Now double click. This will highlight the entire word. Now move the cursor to the toolbar and click on tools. A menu will appear. Move your cursor to the words spelling and grammar and click. Instantly, a small window pops open with the correct spelling and possible alternatives. You see, there's a dictionary built into your word processor that checks the words as you type them. And you don't even have to retype the mistaken word now. Simply move your cursor to the button marked Change and click. The window disappears. And now look at your letter. The word knowledgeable has been spelled correctly automatically. When you finish a document, no matter how long, you can double check the spelling for the entire document with just a few mouse clicks. In order to check an entire document, move the cursor to the taskbar and click on Tools. Now, click on Spelling and Grammar again. Since you haven't highlighted a word, the program checks the spelling for everything in this document. And since the dictionary doesn't recognize the name Harv, it flags it as misspelled and offers some alternate spellings. But you know more than the computer, so you simply tell it to ignore the name Harv because you know that that is spelled correctly. Click on the Ignore button, and the computer will continue to spell check. You see, you can ignore or change any word that the computer brings up in the spell check. Once you've checked the spelling and are happy with a letter, you have to save it. So let's review how you save a document. First, move your pointer to the File menu and click. Then, move down the menu to Save and click. If it's a new document, the software will ask you to name it and will ask you where you want to store this file. Normally, you'll want to save your documents in the folder called My Documents. Now, you must give the document a name. I'm going to call this letter to Harv. Then move your cursor to save and click. Your letter is now saved. You can print it now or email it or close it and reopen it at a later date. But let's say you've looked at this letter and decided that it needs some work. I'm going to show you a tool that makes word processing so much better than simply typing. It's called cut and paste. Move your cursor to the second sentence. Now, I'm going to cut this sentence and move it to the end of the letter. To cut the sentence, I'll select it first. In order to select this sentence, I move the mouse pointer to the first word of the sentence. Now, I hold down the mouse button and drag the pointer to the end of the sentence, keeping the mouse button pressed down. When I let go of the mouse button, the entire sentence is now selected, which I can tell because it's highlighted. To cut this sentence, I'll just move the pointer to the toolbar and click on Edit. Now, I move the pointer down the menu to Cut and click. Now look at the letter. The second sentence is gone, but it hasn't disappeared. It is being saved inside the computer in a place called the clipboard. This place will store it until I want to use this sentence or until I turn off the computer. Now, in order to place that sentence somewhere else, I'll move the pointer to the end of the letter and click. Notice that when I click, the I-shaped pointer becomes a solid line. This is where I want to place that cut sentence. So now I'll move the pointer back up to the toolbar and click on Edit again. This time, I'll move down the menu and click on the line marked Paste. Now look at the letter. The sentence has moved. It's been cut from one place and pasted into another. Using cut and paste, you can change and adjust anything you write at the touch of a key or a click of the mouse. Once you've completed your letter and are satisfied, there are still some interesting things you can do with it. Things you could never do with a typewriter or even with a pen and paper. First, I want to emphasize a point by underlining. I'll move the mouse pointer to the word great and highlight it. Now, I can highlight it by starting the pointer at the beginning of this word, holding down the mouse button, and dragging it across the word. 
or I can simply double click on the word. That selects and highlights the single word automatically in one quick shortcut. Once the word is highlighted, I'll move the pointer to the toolbar. There are three letters here, B, I, and U. I'm going to click on the U, or underline button. Now, look at the highlighted word. The highlighted word has a highlighted underline. When I click on the U again, the underline disappears. When I click on the U once again, the underline is back. Now, if I click anywhere in this document, the underline remains on the word great. Now, let's say I want to emphasize another word in the letter. I'll first move the pointer to the word both and double click on that so that that word is highlighted. Now, I'll move the pointer to the letter I at the right of the toolbar and click. The highlighted word is now italicized. When I click anywhere else on the document, the italics remain. Now, instead of italicizing the word, I decide I want to make it bold. I'll double click on the word both to select that. When I click on the B or the bold button on the toolbar, watch as the highlighted word becomes bold letters. When I click anywhere else in the document or go back to typing, the bold or italics will remain, unless, of course, I change my mind again. And in that case, all it takes is for me to highlight again, hit the same B, I, or U button, and the word will go back to the way it was. Unlike typing or using a pen, word processing lets you change your mind and your document as often as you like. Now, all we have to do is print this letter out. I can quickly click on the printer icon in the toolbar, but I want to explore some other printing options as well. First, I'm going to move the pointer up to the toolbar and click on File. Now, I'll move it down to Print and click. A printer window now opens. In the Page Range window, I can choose to print the entire document, or I can print just certain pages. After I've printed a 20-page document, I may have to change two words on a single page. Rather than print the entire document all over again, I can change the incorrect words and just reprint that single page. The Copies window lets me print numerous copies, which can be printed in order or can be collated as well. But I'm going to print just two copies of this letter, one to mail and one for my files. I'll move the mouse pointer to the text box that says Number of Copies and type 2. Now move down to the button marked OK and click. The letter prints out and it's ready to be mailed. Beginning to use a word processor really isn't much different from using a typewriter. The difference, however, is that once you've mastered the typing part, there is so much more you can do and so much more you can explore, all within your computer. Electronic greeting cards, or e-cards, are one of the most popular things on the Internet. It's like sending a card through the mail, only this card gets there faster, is more entertaining, and sending one is just as fun as getting one. There are a number of e-card sites on the Internet. At a site like BlueMountain.com, for instance, you can find dozens of different types of cards, from get well cards, thank you cards, to email marriage proposals. I'm going to click on Birthdays. Now I'm at a page which gives me a choice of cards and illustrations. I think I like this one, so I'll click on it and see what it looks like.
This is the card, which is animated and has music that goes with it. I can scroll down to personalize the card, filling in the recipient's name and email address, as well as putting my own personal note on the card. Before I send it, I want to check out the finished product. This is the e-card my friend will receive, and I can send it today or choose the date I want it to be mailed. Now, all I have to do is click on send, and off it goes. See? You don't have to be a computer genius to be able to send a personalized, animated, music-enhanced electronic greeting card. We've introduced you to a lot of new computer terms in Part 2. Let's take a quick and easy review of some of the most important words and concepts you've learned. World Wide Web The World Wide Web is one of the most exciting uses of the Internet. The Web gives you access to information from around the world. Every web address begins with the letters www. Browser. Your browser is the software that lets you access the World Wide Web. Some of the most popular browsers are Internet Explorer and Netscape Navigator. Website. There are millions of websites on the Internet. There are websites devoted to news, to travel, to health, to shopping, to almost any topic you can imagine. Home page. Your home page is the first page you see on the World Wide Web. It's simply the place where you start. Whenever you want to get back to your home page, simply click on the button on the toolbar marked home. Back button. You can return to any page you've been to by clicking on the back button. Each time you click, you move to the page you were at previously. The forward button works the same way. Search engine. A search engine helps you locate and categorize information on the web. You can click on categories of a search engine, or you can type a word or phrase in the search window and let the engine comb the web to find your information. Favorites. When you find a website that you want to refer to again, like a news site, you can mark it by putting it on your favorites list. Every time you want to go back to it, just click on favorites, then click on the website's name, and it will appear on your screen. Link. A link connects one web page to another. You can recognize a link because it is underlined, or it looks like a button. When you click on the button or underlined word, you are immediately taken to a new website. E-commerce. E-commerce is the term for shopping on the web. You can buy gifts, books, CDs, groceries, and hundreds of other products Accessories. Accessories are mini programs that are built right into your computer. Accessories like the calculator and the address book make your computer use more effective and useful. And accessories like Solitaire make your computer more fun. Paint box. The paint box is a really neat accessory that allows you to draw and create your own pictures on your computer. Cut and paste. 
by highlighting a text, then clicking on Edit, you can cut the word or phrase. Then simply move the mouse pointer to where you want the phrase to go. And click on Paste. Cut and Paste has made retyping a document a thing of the past. Highlighting. You highlight a word or phrase by double-clicking or dragging over it. When a word is highlighted, you can make the word underlined, give it italics, or make it bold. All with the click of a mouse. Spell check. Many word processors automatically check your spelling and mark misspelled words with an underline. You can backspace and rewrite the word, or you can select from the computer's own list of alternative spellings. E-cards. E-cards, or electronic cards, are greeting cards that you can send over the internet. Many e-cards are animated with musical and special effects. You can find an e-card for just about any occasion you can think of. Computer terms can sometimes be baffling, but we hope this quick and easy review has simplified some of them for you. And don't forget, you can always return to this section. We've explored everything from setting up your computer to using word processing, to emailing, and exploring the World Wide Web. Personal computers really have changed the way we work, interact, and communicate. We hope this video guide has helped you make an easy entry into the world of home computers. And we hope it will encourage you to explore more. So thanks for joining us. And happy computing.